So Ruth covers about 11 or 12 years. From verse 1, verse 1, to verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1 to 18, we find this 10 years of time going past in Moab. So in Moab, Elimelech took his wife and his two sons. When there was famine and there was no food, Elimelech wasn't a poor man, but there was no food for his family. And he left. He left. Elimelech left for Moab and they stayed 10 years in Moab. And chapter 1 deals with this 10 years, which was a very hardened time for them. It wasn't an easy time. It was a tough time. And we'll see that as we go. Chapter 1. Uh, Verse 19, all the way to chapter 2, verse 23, talks about two months. Only two months. Right? So in the next phase of this, there's only two months. That's from mid-April, mid-April to mid-June. To mid-June, um, and this unfolds in Boaz's field. In Boaz's field. As part of the of the barley harvest, right? They were harvesting. And so as part of that, it took place there. Then chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 1, all the way to 18, is one day. Only one day. Uh, and one night. One day plus one. Last part to perform. Verse 1 to 22 is about one year. It's about one year. That is mentioned here in bed. There's also three main role players. Here's Naomi. Naomi, of course, went much hardship. This wasn't easy. This is not, from, from Naomi's perspective, this is not a nice story. This, the, the, the majority of this story is hardship. The story starts with them being in famine. And so fleeing from your own country to a foreign country which is sort of in hostility against your own country and you go there for 10 years, that's, that's no fun, right? And, and in this time you lost your husband, you lost your two sons to death and you are empty. You, you, you've lost everything of value. In, in a space a space of 10 years. And so this seems not to be a good time for her, but it's ber famine and bereavement, but eventually it ends up in a place of peace and of security. So it turns, by the time we get to chapter 4, Naomi is now a woman restored in peace and again restored in security. Yeah. First one, the second main player is Ruth. Now Ruth is a foreign girl, right? That's, that's important to remember. She's a foreign girl, a Moab, from Moab, and who's attached herself to her mother-in-law and the, mother, the God of her mother-in-law. So that's key important. So she attaches herself to Naomi as her mother-in-law and beyond this, she focuses on the God of Naomi. So we saw that from Naomi, there must have been some relationship that developed with, between Naomi and Ruth on, on spiritual basis. And so surely, uh, Elimelech, his sons, and, and, and Naomi, his wife, were still worshipping God, although they went to Boaz because of the famine. They clearly have not fallen into foreign worship of the foreign gods. So they didn't do what everyone else was doing. So we can see from this, from, from Ruth, we can come to realize that Naomi have never turned her back on God, although she felt God turned his back on her, you know, and, 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 and deservingly so, she didn't see it, you know, as not, you know, she just saw that God afflicted her, she experienced God afflicted her, but she was still in a relationship with the one true real God, the God of Israel, Yahweh, she wasn't submitting or turning to Chimoy, which was the, the, the god of the Moabites. She didn't do that. The Chimos, uh, worship Chimos. She still worship Yahweh. And so in the relationship between Naomi and her daughters in 
law, she must have presented to them her relationship with Yahweh, right? And, and clearly it must have impacted Ruth more than oh, the other sister-in-law and, you know, and, and, and really impacted her. And she clings to Naomi, not only for Naomi, but also for Naomi's God, which is important. And we'll see that unfolds in the story that it's not only because of her commitment to Naomi that she's willing to take this bold step of leaving her family, her country, and now return to what will become a foreign country for her, Israel. Um, but it was also because of the God of Naomi, and we'll see that as we're going to go through the book. And then, of course, um, and, and she's the one that received much blessings from God. Incredible, eternal blessings in reality. She, as a foreigner to the Israelites, a woman, became part of the lineage of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's an important aspect. You see how God is inclusive of all, and we'll see that in a moment. And then, of course, there's Boaz. Boaz. That is the other main main role player. Of course, there's some others here that they mentioned in, in lesser importance. Uh, but yes, the three role players. He becomes the kingman's uh, kingman's redeemer of, of Ruth by um, marriage, which also redeems Naomi. So this is like a double redemption. By redeeming Ruth, he at the same time redeems Naomi. Because Naomi have lost both her husband and her two sons. So in the process of Ruth, redeeming Ruth, he ultimately also restores Naomi. Um, he shows kindness to them and, and marrying Ruth, which fits into God's purpose for history. Now family trees is one of the things that's very much preserved in, in scripture. It seems to play an important role and Ruth is no exemption. Ruth adds to that a very important family tree aspect that helps us to see the building up to Christ and to understand how God over thousands of years has never turned His back on mankind. Mankind turned His back on God, but God didn't turn His back on mankind. But God determined by His sovereign plan with man from the beginning, God was involved in that plan and working to the reconciliation of man ultimately in Christ throughout the history of the Old Testament. And Ruth plays a part in that whole story of God's redemption building up to the ultimate main point through Christ the cross and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The historical and theological themes of the book, so the historical, 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 logical themes of the book is also important to spend some time on. All 85 verses of Ruth, it's only got 85 verses, it's a short book, but all of them have been accepted as canonical by the Jews. And so from the beginning this whole letter was embraced, and that's important that all of this has been embraced because it ends up to help us again to see the perseverance, uh, the perseverance of you know the family tree that builds up to Christ. Along with Songs of Solomon, Esther, Ecclesiastics, Lamentations, Ruth stand with the old books of the Megillah, of Megillah, the Megillah, or which is the five scrolls, right? The rabbis read these books in the synagogue on five special occasions during the year. So there's five special occasions throughout the year, uh, five of the feasts of Israel, and during those times, in all of the synagogues in Israel, they will read one of these five books at each one of those occasions, and it is at Pentecost that they will read Ruth. So Ruth is the book of the, the, the scroll of the Migalov that will be read during Pentecost. So what was read? During the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the time of the feast? Ruth. 
Ruth was there, right there. That was the book that they would read at that point in the synagogue, synagogues, right? Uh, all the Jews. Genealogically, Ruth looks back about 900 years in history to events in the time of Jacob. So in chapter 4, verse 11, it points all the way back to Jacob and forward about 100 years to the coming reign of David. And so it stretches to include for us the historical content of about 1,000 years in history from Jacob and the descendants from Jacob all the way to, the, to, to King David uh, as part of persevering, persevering that part of the family tree and the lineage to show how it all fits in together to ultimately build up to Matthews where we will find the lineage of Christ. Um, well, Joshua judges emphasis the legacy of the nations and the land of promise. Ruth focuses on the lineage of David back to the patriarchal area, to the patriarchal area, right, all the way to the fathers. So from the fathers of the faith, all the way from Jacob right through uh, to King David, it includes for us those names that's important in that time frame. Now on the theological theme side, that was on the historical side, on the, on the theological theme side, um, there's at least seven major theologies that is being dealt with in the book of Ruth. Seven, seven main theologies, right? This is, this is how important this 85 verses is. It addresses seven very important theological themes that still impacts us today. And the first one is that Ruth, the Moabite, Moabite illustrates God's redemption plan. God's redemption plan, or redemptive plan rather, redemptive plan, God's redemptive plan extended beyond the Jews, beyond the Jews to Gentiles. So Ruth, who is a foreigner, who is therefore not part of God's chosen people, the Israelites, showed that God from the beginning, as we know, we even read in Genesis, we read through Abraham, that, that the covenant of God is for the nations. It's not just for the nation of Israel, but God's covenant of Abraham is for the nations of the world, right? And so we are inclusive and Ruth points to us to a very specific happening in history that helps us to actually see how it actually unfolds. Because here's a Gentile. A Gentile that becomes part of God's redemptive plan in history. And so she's inclusive. She becomes part of God's people. She worships together at Shiloh, which is the worship place of the Israelites. And so that plays a big part in the history, right? And so important, therefore, Gentiles are inclusive, right? You have to remember something about the book of Ruth is that it points to God's redemptive plan includes Gentiles. Number two is Ruth demonstrates that women are co heirs are co heirs with men of God's with men of God's salvation grace. So here in 1 Peter 3 verse 7 we see how the apostles in laying down the foundation of that we would build on, you know, for the Church of Christ Jesus, woman is co heirs with men. Ruth indicates that her part to be played in God's redemptive order 
is to point to the fact that not only because she is a Gentile, but also as a woman Gentile, she could be inclusive in God's redemptive plan. And then ultimately we know that will be true for Jews as well, in a similar way. The third important theological term that we find here is that Ruth portrays the virtuous woman, the virtuous woman, the virtuous woman of Proverbs, of Proverbs. And that is, of course, Proverbs 31, verse 10. So we can look at Ruth 3 verse 11. Proverbs 31 verse 10. Now, some people assume that when the Proverbs were written, at the time when it was written, that the writer ultimately had known about the story and actually had it in his mind when he was writing the story of the virtuous woman in this book of wisdom. Uh, this book, you know, helping us to understand the wisdom of God in, in some ways and sense. And here Ruth becomes a picture of what we see the virtuous woman is all about. And it seems like this story that has gone on through history to, you know, an historical, you know, resemblance through generation after generation ultimately have shown again uh, the importance of the book of Ruth. And here's someone that can that we actually can refer back to when we read Proverbs 31 and we can say, well, Ruth is such a woman. Ruth is of that kind. Ruth points to us. Now remember, what does it ultimately mean? That the woman that we talk about, the virtuous woman of Proverbs, will point to a woman that lives in the wisdom of God in relationship to God, right? Mm -hmm. It will point to that, you know, the perfect, the perfect relationship in, in, you know, when we live in wisdom, when we live in the wisdom of God, when we live in truth with God. And so, pull it back, it seems like Ruth is one of those women who will stop at no sacrifice. She will not uh, worry about the shame that could come upon her. She doesn't worry about the embarrassment she doesn't worry about anything, rejection, whatever you want to call. She, she's going to live through that for the goal of seeing God's hand at work bringing redemption to mankind. And so the virtuous woman of Proverbs indicates the same. Here's someone that will work through all shame, through all rejection, through whatever else, but ultimately will receive blessing, right? Through salvation. And here Ruth received blessings through salvation regardless of all the struggles, of all the shame, of all the rejection. And so it becomes a picture of that. And that's same for us as believers. We are redeemed by Christ. And we can live up to the likeness of Christ. Because regardless of how much shame we bring in, how much baggage, how much rejection we bring in from the past, we can still be redeemed and live in Christ now a full life. That's the power of redemption. Redemption brings us, restores us, and makes us to become an example, to become a living witness, to become a living testimony that can bring others to salvation as well. Number four. So Ruth describes God's sovereign and providential care. This is chapter 1, verse 6, and 4, verse 13 of Ruth. And two, verse three, last two, verse three, and so the whole story is about this. The whole story is, is about God sovereignly in control and God providing for unimportant people, people that seemingly doesn't really matter much to, to us and on, on history grounds as well as current grounds. Doesn't really make much sense. Yet God in his sovereignty and in his providential care he used unimportant people like this at apparently in significant times. This wasn't an important time, you know, 
there wasn't there was no need that something like this should happen at that at that specific point. There was no invention in history that called for something like that necessarily. But yet God, through the natural event of people that goes through the natural struggles of life and the nat natural situations of life, could sovereignly get involved and provide to build up to such an amazing story um, to bring and accomplish His ultimate will. And so God's will comes to ordinary people through ordinary circumstances where He can find obedience in mankind and God's provisional care could help us to see God's will unfold in our lives. And, and many of us in this room can just probably think back of situations in our day and age, in our life, where we can see God working in a similar way because God is still sovereign and God is still providing. And so the providence of God plays therefore a huge role in the book of Ruth. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time on specifically looking at the providence of God because the providence of God is what Ruth is helping us to understand how incredibly God provides for whatever is needed in all circumstances from His own sovereign power and plan so that His will can be fulfilled in every way. The fifth one, Ruth, the long, long of Tamar, Tamar, which we read about in Genesis 38, Rab, Rab, which we read about in Joshua chapter 2, and Achiba, Achiba, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 12, stand in the genealogy of and the messianic line. Would we choose for these people to be included in the lineage of the messianic unfolding of his the preparation of the way to the coming of the Messiah of the world? Here we find Ruth, the Moabite, someone who was not even allowed or included to worship among the Israelites, because he's a Moabite. Tamar. Tamar is, in the Bible, Judah's daughter-in-law, who, we know the whole story about Tamar, her husband died, her brother is supposed to be with her as a kinsman redeemer, to bring a child into life for the sake of his brother. He didn't do that. God killed him too because of his, he was willing to sleep with her, but he wasn't willing to make her pregnant. And so uh, uh, God killed him for that. Now some people will use that to say, you know, that that's to do with abortion. And that's not to do with abortion. That's purely his disobedience to fulfill what God purposed for him to do as a law within the Jewish uh, family, the Jewish culture. He didn't do that. And then what happened is Tamar uh, prepared herself to appear as a prostitute, sitting at the, at the gate of, of the town. Um, and Judah, the old Judah, is looking for some fun, or whatever you want to call it. But in a sinful situation, thinks he's a prostitute. And so he asked her to come with him, he wants to sleep with her, and he sleeps with her, willing to sleep with a prostitute. And then later, of course, he, she goes through a whole ordeal where she, um, he gave, she wants certain items that's personal to him to be left with her as a sign that, you know, he will take care, you know, and he will give her a pledge of what he will give her for her sleeping with him. And so she kept that, and later people came to her, and they say, Tamar, your daughter-in-law have committed sexual immorality, and she should be put to death, and Judah is ready to do that. And then she sent the stuff to him and say, well, you can know who is the one, because nobody knows 
who have made her pregnant and yes she's three months pregnant and this is something that deserves death and she sent the stuff to Judah and to his surprise he discovered that he actually has fathered his daughter-in-law himself and so it rescued her life of course but again through lies and deceit and prostitution and sexual immorality you name all these sinful things and so Rao came involved in, in God's plan and yes she lies about hiding the, the men and save their lives through them you know and so she's been involved but again she ended well she's even mentioned as a woman of faith in Hebrews that's, that's how far she went and then there's Batsheba. And Batsheba, well, she falls under the pressure of king's power and abuse. And she becomes part of a sinful relationship. And eventually her husband was murdered by King David. Now that's not her fault, that's not her doing. But even Batsheba, who brought in to be the next lineage after David, that will follow on David. I mean, David had wife before, he had children before. He didn't have to be with her to ultimately make it to be continued. Right? But through the adulterous relationship is born the next lineage of the Messiah. What does that indicate to us? What does this indicate to us? God is not a God of favoritism. God is not a God that look at mankind and esteem mankind from any position. Regardless of who you are, you can be a rude. Someone who by law is not allowed to worship among the, in the temple or the tabernacle of the Jews could be in the presence of God's people worshiping their God to a woman who brought a father into a sinful situation, he himself committing sexual immorality in his own desire and lust to want to sleep with a prostitute, and through that comes the next lineage of the messianic line, and then there's a Rahab, a prostitute in her career for the next lineage, and then there's the Siva who brings into life through an idolatrous relationship the next lineage of Christ Jesus. And you know what it really points us to? That doesn't, doesn't man mind anything about how, how sinful we are. How terrible we are as a human being. Through the plan of God, through His providential care, for His intervention into history who ultimately unfolds to the primitive place by through Christ Jesus all of us can be inclusive in the redemption plan of Jesus Christ he didn't just came for good people he came for everyone and everyone can be part of God's plan and so today everyone can still be part of bringing the next people to become part of God's redemption plan Amen. doesn't matter if you've been a criminal doesn't matter if you've been an adulterer doesn't matter if you've been a drunkard it doesn't matter what you have been what matters is what you become in God through Christ Jesus and then God can use you just as powerful there's no difference this is huge for our understanding of the power of redemption because this is a redemption story. The whole story of Ruth is a redemption story and it helps us to see the power of redemption regardless of how deep we have sunk away from God's plan. The righteousness of God is imputed on a sinful man through Christ Jesus or through God's redemption. And so she could become righteous, not because of her lies, she could become righteous because she turns from her lies. She turns from her old life and become a woman of faith. And therefore she can become a righteous woman. So what does it indicate to us? 
at the end of, of Rab's life. What does, because the Bible is not about Rab. The Bible is about redemption. And so when we get to Hebrews and it tells us about the Rab's transformed life, a prostitute, a lying prostitute, a deceiving prostitute, to be mentioned as now a righteous person. What do we know about that in context of Scripture? That somewhere long from here to the future, this woman must have had an encounter with God. There must have been a transformation in her life. But it's not, she's not righteous because she's robbed. She's righteous because of God. Who imputed on her a righteousness that's not from herself. So an, an ordinary woman, most probably an outcast woman, could still become a righteous in the sight of God. Through His sovereign and providential care. Not through her efforts. Not through anything she has done. We look at these people's lives and all their lives tells us miserable, 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 except maybe Ruth. But she's discounted. She's outcasted. She's not bad. But she did worship a foreign god. She had idols in her life, which is equal to having sexual immorality, which is equal to be a liar, which is equal to commit adultery. The one is also separating us from God. So what we see here is this is all ordinary people separated from God through their sinful behaviors in life, but yet when they turn to God, they could become part of God's providential care that brings His sovereign plan of redemption to become a reality in their lives and in the lives of those that will follow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That's powerful to, to understand that ordinary people, this is no special people here. Not one of them will be encountered in any way by us. Yet in God's sight, they're so special that we today talk about them thousands of years later. Thousands of years later, we can, we can point to them as part of the story of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, that's amazing. That is God at work. That is God's redemption and not man's plan of forgiveness and restoration, but God's plan of bringing the unrighteous, the sinful, to become righteous before Him. Okay? Number six. Boaz is a type of Christ. He's a type of Christ like Joseph. Is a type of Christ. Here also we find another type of Christ. He, be Christ, he becomes Ruth's. He becomes Ruth's kinsman redeemer. Chapter 4, verse 1 to 12. Type of Christ. In the likeness of Christ, who came and rescued her from being empty, being finished, have no future, have no hope, have no life. In Boaz, Ruth again are fulfilled. She's been restored. She's been redeemed. And even Ruth, I mean Naomi, ultimately indirectly is also been redeemed and has also been brought to peace through the redemption of Boaz. So Boaz is a type of Christ that comes from our lives. Type of Christ who comes into our lives. You know, at the right time when we don't deserve it, when we can't really claim it, there's nothing we can do to earn it, there's nothing we can do to deserve it. Christ came into history, laid his life down in our place, so that we who are empty, we who are lost, we who have no future, we who have no hope, we who are miserable, we who are like the Naomi because of our sins, who are like the Ruth who clings to Naomi, but still in herself she's not fulfilled can be fulfilled.